Thank you again for listening to the Moral Imagination Podcast. I'm delighted to have as my guest today, Mary Eberstadt. She is a prolific writer and a wonderful thinker, and I'm very happy to have her on the podcast. We're going to talk about her latest book, Primal Screams, How the Sexual Revolution Created Identity Politics. And I think this book is really important for lots of reasons. Number one, she goes through empirical data. Two, I think she gives us a really good way of understanding a lot of the problems that are going on today. If you want to get a better grasp on understanding things with identity politics or uh, transgenderism, the Me Too movement, a lot of things, what Mary explains is a lot of this comes back down to the breakdown of the family. So she uses empirical evidence, and she also makes very important arguments and connects it even back to the animal kingdom, that if you think about the idea of a treed cat, like a treed cat is a cat that can't get down from the tree. And why can it not get out from the tree? Because it lacks the social learning that it would have had from its siblings and its parents. And so in many ways, a lot of us today are like treed cats. We don't know who we are. We don't have a family structure to protect us. So this, I think, is a very, very important episode. And as you'll hear me talk about, I think it's important also because Mary is both first giving empirical evidence, but also there's an empathetic, like a way of understanding. It helps us think understanding some of the suffering. And this is the idea of a primal scream, something from the dead that we all need family. So I hope you enjoy the podcast. Let me tell you a little bit about Mary Aberstadt. She holds the Panula Chair at the Catholic Information Center at Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., is a senior research fellow at Faith and Reason Institute. Again, she's the author of Primal Screams that has commentaries by Rod Dreher, Mark Lilla, and Peter Thiel. Her other books include It's Dangerous to Believe, How the West Really Lost God, and Adam and Eve After the Pill. Mrs. Eberstadt's writing have appeared in many magazines and journal. Her 2010 novel, The Loser Letters, about a young woman in rehab struggling with atheism, was adapted for stage and premiered at Catholic University in the fall of 2017. Seton Hall University awarded her an honorary doctorate in humane letters in 2014. During the Reagan administration, she was a speechwriter, Secretary of State George Shultz, and a special assistant to Ambassador Jean J. Kirkpatrick at the United Nations. And you can learn all about her work at maryaberstadt.com. And as always, I'll put show notes, links to the books we discuss, and other resources at themoralimagination.com. So please, if you like the podcast, I appreciate it if you give me a five-star review at Apple Podcasts. Again, take a look at my book, Digital Contagion on 10 steps to protect yourself from digital intrusion and surveillance capitalism. And you can learn all about that and get a free infographic at themoralimagination.com. So thank you again for listening. I appreciate all the people who've given me support and written reviews. And I hope you enjoy the interview with Mary Eberstadt on her book, Primal Screams, How the Sexual Revolution Created Identity Politics. And so I'm delighted to have on the Moral Imagination Podcast, Mary Eberstadt, and we're going to talk about her book, Primal Screams, How the Sexual Revolution Created Identity Politics. Thank you so much for joining the Moral Imagination Podcast. Thanks for having me, Michael. Well, I'm really delighted to have you. And and let's maybe just begin. uh, This is a great book. I really like this book. As I said to you before, I think it's important in so many ways because it sheds light on things that, that we know that are in a sense obvious, but also sheds light on things that we just aren't paying attention to, that we're not seeing, and it articulates it in a really important way. So maybe we could just start for listeners. What's the big picture, kind of the the big theme argument of the book, Primal Screams? The big picture argument is that there is a major story of our time that I think is underattended, and that story is family decline. And when I say family decline, I don't mean it in a a lamenting sense. I mean it in an empirical sense. There have been revolutionary changes to family structure, not only in the United States, but across the Western world. And to name just a few of them, widespread abortion, fatherlessness, single parent homes, the shrinking of the family, the shrinking of the extended family. And my point, Michael, is that all of these characteristics of our post-sexual revolution age are acts of human subtraction. In other words, they have operated to take people out of other people's lives. And so the result is that we have a much smaller protective infrastructure around us than our ancestors did. Why is this important? Well, You know, usually when people talk about family decline, they connect it to individual things like 
loneliness, uh, lack of connection, and other uh, what we might call microscopic effects. But I am connecting it in this book to some much bigger questions because I think that the decline of the family combined with the decline of religion, which we can also get into, has ended up fracturing modern people in a way that we are only beginning to understand. And I think we're starting to see this play out in our politics and our society, and it is at the heart of some of our biggest social problems. So in one, and it seems like one of the arguments is that if we want to understand identity politics and, and the rise of identity politics, this kind of tribalism, and we can talk about different ways of thinking about tribalism because you write about that in the book, but that if we want to understand identity politics, part of the reason identity politics is so strong is because there's a breakdown of family and religion, and so people can't answer that fundamental question, who am I? So the, the sociologist Robert Nisbet argued in his book, 1953 book, right, we're, in a, we're questing for community. And now we're even more than questing for community, we're questing for identity. <clears throat> And that seems to be like, is that, am I understanding that, that part of your book, that that's one of the driving forces of this kind of tribalist identity and almost rage that's out there is that people have lost family connections. Absolutely. And I don't think it's almost rage. I think there's a great deal of rage about the loss of these primordial connections that all of us need. So in sociology, some giants like Robert Nisbet, Robert Putnam have devoted attention, as you note, to this idea of community and the decline of community in the modern Western world. But the first community of all is the family, and not nearly enough attention, I think, has been devoted to what it means that we do not have those building blocks as reliably as the people who came before us. So to take this down to earth a little bit, who are you, Michael? If I were to ask you that question, you might give me your professional title. More likely you would answer if we were just having gentle conversation that you're a a husband, a father, whatever your familial connections are, just as I would tell you about my husband, my children, uh, my cousins, whatever it might be, my ancestors. What we have to understand is that for a lot of people, especially younger people, these ways of answering the question of identity are no longer there. We have young people growing up uh, about 40% of the time without a biological father in the house, for example. That automatically takes off the table a very important person in the lives of many human beings. Families are smaller. I can't emphasize that enough. Why? because we know from research that one of the ways we learn as human beings is through our siblings, through our siblings and through our parents. And this model is replicated across the animal kingdom. I hope we can talk about that a little bit too, because there's fascinating research on how important animal families are to animals functioning in the way that they're meant to function. So again, for a lot of people out there, there is, mass confusion as the sense of self just seems to evaporate into the ether and as people can't look around them and be sure of those close connections in the same way. And this, I believe, is what's driving this frantic flight to collectivized identities, political identities, identities based on gender and the rest people are struggling to answer the question, who am I? Because they have been deprived, unwittingly deprived, but deprived nevertheless of traditional ways of answering that question. You know, that's actually one of the things I I like, I like your book in so many ways, but one of the things I like about your book is that, right, as you said in the last part, people are struggling. And there's a sense in the book of like, maybe a pious language would be charity and truth, like your or truth and charity. Like you're telling the truth as best you can and you're not backing away from the truth, but there's a sense of gentleness, like people are hurting. And so there's a, a I think a desire to understand and articulate look like what seems to be unintelligible rage or kind of like snowflakes or 
all these other things that people, you know, create like a lot of political reaction. You say, well, actually, people are creating defensive strategies to deal with the fact that they're alone and they don't know who they are. And and I think that's another value of the book because it's it's both like empirically rigorous, but also has a certain human element to it because it takes seriously our social nature and what happens when we're deprived of it. Am I getting that right? Yes, very much so. Thank you. I think that generally speaking, traditionalists have made a big mistake in not acknowledging the suffering out there, in choosing to mock it instead. And I think that ignoring of human suffering is a moral mistake But in addition to that, it's an empirical mistake because this kind of suffering is an empirical fact of our time. We see it reflected at one end of life uh, uh, in loneliness studies, especially among the elderly. Uh, We see it reflected in the loneliness of the young about which much is being made. We see it reflected in the rise in psychiatric problems among Zoomers and millennials in particular, all of this is real. And I argue in Primal Screams, it's all coming from the same place. It's coming from the fact that that reliable set of faces around the baby's crib aren't there in the same way anymore. And the idea of going to stay with extended family, say, if one's having a problem in one's nuclear family, That sort of thing isn't there anymore in the same way. We have a numbers shortage that is translating into a humanitarian problem. Yeah, and I think that's that's well said. The suffering is real and it has a source, but in one sense, we don't want to talk about the source because that, in a sense, walks us into a lot of areas that we don't want to pay attention. So I guess maybe my last big picture question is, I've made somewhat of an an argument there that we don't want to talk about it. Why do you think there's no attention? In one sense, it's kind of obvious. And when I say obvious, you know, for listeners, like the, there's empirical data on this, not just in in your book, but across, there's a lot of empirical data on this. Why, despite very strong empirical data that there's family breakdown, and then as you, as you demonstrate in the book, like whether it's pop music, rap, or movies, like the manifestation of the kind of angst, suffering, and pain that comes from the brokenness. Why is there such a lack of attention to the breakdown of the family that, and I say this with, with respect for your book, like, like why did you have to write this book? And it's so kind of like, it's almost obvious and you have to write this book. That's not obvious, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Why do you think that, why do you think that lack of attention is there? Yeah, I think there are a couple of answers to that because in one sense, what I'm writing about has been obvious at least since the 1960s and the infamous Moynihan report. But in another way, I think what makes it hard to talk about this for many people is that we are all affected by it one way or another, and no one wants to give offense. There is not a family in America, one would guess, outside of very small enclaves that has not been affected by the embrace of the sexual revolution, whether that means divorce, abortion, out-of-wedlock births, etc., And so there's a natural desire not to want to give offense. But it's also the case, Michael, that another reason for resistance is that some people, and I think uh, the majority of those people would be men and especially predatory men, uh, really enjoy the fruits of the revolution. And they are reluctant to trace any of our social problems to these kinds of factors because that, that shines a light on something that they don't want to see. So there is resistance uh, to the idea of rollback of any kind of the sexual revolution. We see this most obviously in the case of abortion. People on the traditionalist side often wonder, how can the other side defend this, this act up until the moment of birth? Well, the reason is that, again, The idea of rolling back any of the sexual revolution is very threatening to people because they're afraid that if one thing goes, the next thing won't be far behind. So all of these factors bundled together add up to 
a fierce resistance to discussing most of the things that I've discussed in the book, which doesn't make them any less empirically defensible. Right. And it's well said. So maybe I, ha- I want to go to the question of animals because you start that and I think it's very important, but maybe one question. So I've interviewed um, on the podcast, um, Carrie Gress, who wrote a book called um, Anti-Mary, which is a kind of a critique of toxic feminism. And then um, she, I interviewed her, her co-author in another book called Theology of Home, Noel Maring, who wrote a book called Awake, Not Woke. And, and we actually talk a little bit about the sexual revolution in, in those podcasts. So I'll, for listeners, I'll put links up to those. You can listen to this and those podcasts. And part of what we do talk about is this in a sense that the sexual revolution empowers certain men. Right. It, and, and I think that you, you bring this, this point up and there, I think that's maybe not politically correct to say, but I think it's, it is correct that in a sense that the sexual revolution empowers certain kind of men who are predatory. It has negative effects on, on men, women, and children, but that there's this, in a sense, we allow injustices to take place, whether it's abuse or, you know, you talk about the Me Too movement, which we can get to later. We talk abortion, um, sexual abuse of children in a sense. And what we almost do is we like, we say, oh, well, that's just your identity or that's just the way things are. And we acquit the abuser in a sense. We are powerful men. So maybe you disagree with that. You can comment. But my question after I, in addition to my comment is maybe could you try to articulate at least briefly when you say the sexual revolution, like what do you mean by the sexual revolution, at least in in kind of a bullet form format, so that listeners can say, okay, I see, because your 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 subtitle is the sexual revolution created identity politics. So, what's the sexual revolution? So that's a subject that academics can quibble about, but I think one easily agreed to definition is we are talking about the technological shock of the pill, which is followed by the embrace of the pill and the destigmatization of non-marital sex. And we have seen this again, not only in the United States, but across the Western world. And what happens with the destigmatization of non-marital sex is that the next thing to go is abortion. In country after country, once the pill is adopted, within a few years, usually abortion is legalized in one form or another because abortion becomes a necessary backup plan to the pill. So another way of putting this is to say that the sexual revolution countermands uh, the Judeo-Christian moral code that goes all the way back. From its inception, Christianity especially had a strict moral code that put off limits all kinds of practices that were common among the Romans, infanticide, bestiality, abortion, et cetera, et cetera. So in in a way, the sexual revolution comes full circle, and one by one it says, well, no, let's let's look at this again. Let's look at non-marital sex again. Okay, check that box. That that gets a pass. And this is what we're seeing in society is the continuing erosion of what had been longstanding taboos, of which I think by now the only one left standing is pedophilia, and that one is also increasingly questioned uh, as the West continues to secularize. Right. And unfortunately, the, it exists and it causes a lot of harm and suffering for people, which I think is also created to connected to not so much identity politics, but like identity of, say, sexual dysphoria. Um, it's oftentimes connected to abuse. And when we say that's your identity, in a sense, as I said before, we're acquitting the abuser and not actually dealing with what happened. So, Yes, I'm- on that point, Michael, uh, something apropos, it happened right before our interview, I was taking notes about the current vogue for chosen families. I don't know if you've heard that term, but the idea is that the nuclear family is a hothouse of oppression and that people should be allowed to choose their families and construct them however they want to. Now, on one level, this looks anodyne enough. But on another level, of course, it's intended as an attack on the traditional family. And the reason I was looking at this was that I was mindful of a number of studies that have been done about the risks to children and teenagers of unrelated males in the home. And they are stunning. I know because I was just looking at these studies. 
Uh, one estimated that the risks for sexual and physical abuse are raised by 50 times once the biological father is out of the home and an unrelated male is in the home. And if you just Google around, you can find lots of work on this subject because it turns out that particularly mom's boyfriend as abuser is really a thing. So mm -hmm. this is to say I am agreeing with your point that for reasons that are not entirely clear, we do seem to acquit the abusers. Um, and not only in the case of, say, Me Too at times, but also in this other realm involving children and teenagers, by refusing to see that what keeps them safest, generally speaking, is both biological parents in the home. Right. I think I completely agree. Yeah, I've seen, I haven't seen those, this, some, I, but I've seen some studies on like the day that it really becomes dangerous when the, when the biological father's replaced. But yeah, I think, and I think again, I mean, you don't have to agree with this and I know, but I do think that, um, and maybe I've talked about this before in the podcast, but the, that we you know this whole kind of identity, like maybe people have been abused and now they're struggling maybe with like homosexual tendencies or something. They're not sure. And instead of saying like, we don't say with somebody who's struggling with anorexia, oh, well, you know, that's who you are. But we do that with people who are struggling sexually when it, and oftentimes, not always, right? There's Girardian contagion. You talk about Girard later in your book, but oftentimes there's abuse at the source of this. Someone has been hurt. And instead of saying, okay, well, what happened? Let's try to work this out. Let's try to like think about justice. We're like, well, that's who you are. And I think that's like an injustice upon an injustice, um, which I think is deeply problematic and that we just, we don't want to address. Very much so. I wrote a piece for Newsweek last year about exactly this because I was reading a, an essay about non-binary celebrities, people who have come out as non-binary. And I was thinking, what, what is this new thing? So I went looking into it and I just happened to make a list of the people mentioned and then I checked their Wikipedia pages and other perfectly public sources and found that in every case, there were two variables, family breakup, parental breakup, and sexual or physical abuse in youth, period. That got me curious. And so I made a list of other people as I saw their names come up who were non-binary celebrities. And again, the same thing happened. Now, we don't see this discussed in public, but it was striking that within an hour of uh, spending an hour of time on Google, all of these dots were connecting about these variables, which are not in the background of most people. At least most people have not suffered doubly from this kind of thing. So again, ignoring suffering is always wrong. And it's also in this case, leading us to put the wrong names on things. Yes, I think that's right. And I think it's also a failure of adults to like help people through the normal vicissitudes of life. We instead, you know, either use children for political tools or, or for, you know, other maybe nefarious purposes, but I think it's a problem. Um, okay. Well, let, let's move from that into a couple of, 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 um, questions that you begin the book with a discussion of animals, which I thought was great. And, um, Lately, I've been studying biology. I, I like biology now, so I'm I'm a, I'm a philosopher, but I'm studying biology, and I, I'm super into biology. And I read, you know, neuroscience. And I've actually had a couple of interviews on the podcast with neurosurgeons. And one of the things I talk about a lot when I talk about, say, especially like a Jewish and Christian vision of the person, is that we're we there's kind of two errors of materialism, and then there's errors of spiritualism. And so the materialist says, our body is all we are. And the spirits is like, we're just kind of like spirits and we're driving around our body like we're driving around the car. But you know, the book of Genesis says that we're made out of the dust of the earth. And so we're embodied persons, we're biological beings. And they, it's quite incredible. And I think thinking about this in a, as embodied persons and sold organisms is really a rich way of, of thinking. So I was actually happy that you started talking just about animals because, you know, as Aristotle and Aquinas say, we're we're rational animals, we're political animals, but we are animals. We're mammals and we're biological beings. Sometimes people say, you know, we share 96% of, of DNA or 98% with the chimpanzee, to which I say, great. We also share about 60% with the banana. So, <laughs> you know, we are, but we're made out of the dust of the earth. And so anyway, th that, as that is the preface, I just, I really liked the fact that you continually 
talk about like animal behavior, whether it's social learning or family or et cetera. I think it's important because so many new studies have shown this, what we thought, and this goes to what your point is, we thought was the, uh, the, that the lone wolf is actually a myth. So can you talk about like your use of animals and maybe why you, you, you think it's such an important uh, way of thinking as we think about the human family? Yes, of course. Well, it starts in the fact that I'm an animal softy myself. And so for years, just as an avocation, I've tried to keep up with the scientific literature. And I also use animals in the book for the reason that we were discussing earlier. I was thinking that maybe if the denial in talking about human beings and the sexual revolution were as fierce as it is, maybe another way of making the point would be to invoke the animal kingdom because it's very apt. So I start the book with the story of the lone wolf. And this is a phrase we've all heard. And we've all probably assumed that somewhere out there, the wolves wander around by themselves doing wolf-like things. And that that's why that stereotype exists. But it turns out, Michael, this is not true at all. Some intensive studies on wolves during the past 20 years have revealed quite the opposite. Wolves live in nuclear families, sometimes with a related female in tow who is not part of her own nuclear family, but wolves live the way we are now told is a hothouse of oppression, that is to say, in nuclear families. And it turns out it isn't only wolves. The same is true of most of the mammals. And We have to ask why this would be. The answer turns out to be simple. It's called social learning. Animals, contrary to what Descartes seemed to think, were not born knowing how to be the things that they are. They have to learn just as we have to learn. And they learn and we learn in societies of our own. So I give the example later in the book of the cat that gets up a tree and can't get down. And I think that's a particularly fascinating example because some cats can climb down from trees and some cats mean that the fire department has to come and get the cat down from the tree. Well, what is the difference here? The current thinking among scientists is that the cats that can get down from the tree learned it probably from their siblings or their mother. And the cats that can't get down from trees haven't had that same observation. So, Some cats have a social learning deficit uh, when measured against other ones. And this, I think, applies to humanity as well. It's what the sexual revolution has done to us. It has left some of us with more of a deficit of social learning than others. And I think this is especially obvious when we look at the Me Too movement, whenever we get into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I mean, well, maybe we could just go into it now. I mean, you because you talk about, I mean, unless you think it's too early, if you want to kind of work out maybe some of the earlier, your earlier part of the argument, because the Me Too movement comes later in your book as kind of an example, I think it was really good of social learning where you talked about the treed cat so that men have not socially learned how to address women because, because the family's broken down, they're not, they're not, they don't have brothers and sisters. And so the sense of like, and then of course the scourge of pornography has really malformed men to really see women as objects. And then on the opposite side, you say women don't have social learning, even like very highly educated kind of elite educated women don't have social learning. They're not sure of just what we in the past would be called common sense. And I liked this. You said, look, this doesn't mean that women of the Me Too movement aren't victims. You said the courts say they're victims and the court's more reliable than public opinion. But, and and this was an analogy I I thought that was really good. You said, if you're told don't go into a dark alley at night and you go in and you get mugged, you're still a victim, but the advice was sound. And I think maybe you could talk about this part of the the Me Too movement because I've kind of summarized it, but like it's a lack of social learning on men and a lack of social learning from women. Maybe talk about it and then the sources. You've already kind of a little bit talked about the source, but maybe elaborate. Yeah. So I don't think we can understand the age we live in without understanding this paradox, which is that 
people today are more sexually experienced and sexually knowledgeable thanks to the internet than ever before in history. And yet at the same time, I think they understand the opposite sex less than ever before in history. And the reason is, again, the shrinking and implosion of the family. This connects to Me Too in a very obvious way. If you read the accounts of those mostly young women in media, in Hollywood, in all of these really august precincts, coming forward with accusations about the men in their lives and seeming absolutely shocked in every case that these things had happened to them, that going to a man's hotel room in the middle of the night would result in something awful happening, that being uh, alone in his summer place might expose you to some kind of danger. And the reason that I think this is important, Michael, is that these young women were the products of elite education, of everything that material society seems to offer. And yet they were less knowledgeable about the risks of being women in certain situations than they could possibly be expected to be. And that means they're vulnerable. I think this vulnerability, which operates at a very subliminal level, because after all, young women have been told they're not vulnerable. They're just as strong as men. They're just as good as men. They can do all the same things men can do. This, I think, is embraced consciously by many young women, but underneath, they know they are vulnerable. And I think that knowledge that they can't act on results in certain deformations. I think feminism is largely about that. I think feminism is not very well understood. It's not about a bunch of victorious Amazons who are ruling the world. It's about women acting tough and banding together because that they don't have men in their lives or the men in their lives are unreliable and not to be trusted. So once again, if we try to just follow the thread here, we see that the implosion of the family is the first thing. And with it comes all of these acts of subtraction, the removal of people from your life whom you can trust and look to. And then it translates into social phenomena like the Me Too movement, where the women are unknowing of the dangers they face and the men, for their parts, are also unknowing in a different way. When one of the top guys in media fell from grace, he said something I've never forgotten. He had been accused by eight young women of truly um, beyond caddish behavior, truly reprehensible behavior. And he said, well, I'm sorry, but I always thought I was pursuing shared feelings. That betrays a different kind of unknowingness. That, of course, is the the chief narrative of pornography, that no matter what the woman seems to be experiencing, it's actually all wonderful and she's, you know, just crazy for this guy. And in that way, I think pornography has done incredible damage to romance, to the sexes understanding each other. But that kind of damage is being piled on top of the damage of not really understanding much about the opposite sex in the first place, which I think comes from the shrunken, broken homes that are now features of our landscape. I mean, consider if biological fathers are missing in almost half of American homes, what does that mean for a boy in those homes? It means growing up in a feminized order Uh, in which the implicit message is that men are bad. Mom may be heroic, and I happen to think single mothers are heroic. I was raised for a while by a single mother myself. But her heroism does not completely make up for the fact that that boy is growing up in a distorted environment in which social learning about manhood is absent. This, I think, is what we're seeing replicated not only in Me Too, but in the kinds of social phenomena that people find disturbing, like why is so much of rap and popular music as raunchy as it is, for example. 
to take an obvious example. So again, in all of these realms, it's so ironic because we have been told to think of the sexual revolution as being about private acts only. This is just private stuff, right? It doesn't affect anything else. So just shut up about it and go away. But these private behaviors are now having massive consequences, including social and political consequences, which is why I think we have to understand what they're rooted in. Right. Yeah, no, it's, it's well said. I think, you know, I sometimes will say to my boys and girls, I have, I have daughters and sons, that men, you're, I, say, I tell boys, you have two choices. You're either going to be a protector or a predator. Uh, or I think there's a third choice, which is kind of a weak enabler of predators. That's how I articulate it. And that's what I tell my boys. Like, you're going to make a choice. Are you going to be a protector, a predator? And if you're going to not choose, then you're just lukewarm and you're enabling predators. What do, do you think, what do you think about that from your, like, you know, you study this deeply. Do you think that my insight has any connection to like empirical experience and, or, or what, what would you, how would you respond or correct or critique that? Sure. Well, I think it's, again, I think it goes straight to the heart of the problem out there. So what does it mean if your choice is between being a predator or a protector? And I agree with you that that is the fundamental choice men face. Well, if you're not really a predator, but you also have nothing to protect, you might end up as an incel. There's a reason why there's an incel movement. Maybe can you explain what that is? As I understand it, it's uh, furious young men who believe that the alpha men, men go around picking off all the girls. And so the incels are more or less deliberately celibate and angry about it because they have grown up in the post-revolutionary world where sex as recreation has been promised to everyone, but where in reality, as the incels do understand, it is disproportionately sent the way of the alpha males of the world. So if, again, the, the problem here, at least one problem here, is that due to the shrinkage of the family and the implosion of the family, a lot of men don't have things to protect. And I agree with you completely that protectiveness is part of male nature uh, with, with the proper nurture. And where does that energy go if it can't be exercised, if men don't have siblings, if men don't have uh, children of their own to protect. Well, a lot of it just seems to go into playing video games uh, and watching other stuff in the basement 24-7. This actually connects, we were talking about this before, that to this problem of the great resignation that we're seeing. And I don't know how many millions of men are now out of the workforce between 18 and 54. These are able-bodied men who've checked out. And I was talking to Anthony Bradley about this just in, in another coast. Anthony, I did a podcast with him on his book on crime. But Anthony, you know, he said like, he kind of described it as, well, if you think about like men, and even like not just poor men, wealth, upper middle class men, like all across the spectrum, all across race and ethnicity are just checking out. They just like, I'm, there's nothing for me to do here. And he said, the way he described it, he said, you know, you can just go to resign.org and we're going to give you all the video games and pornography and, um, and even kind of social friendship and challenges that you want. And well, you can kind of escape from life. And then your husband, Nicholas Aberstadt wrote a book called men without work. And that this is like a, a real problem. And I said to you, I said, I think, I mean, I think it's like you, you guys wrote the, the two of you wrote like a, maybe on accident, maybe on purpose, uh, uh, related books or complimentary books, because I think there's a, men have, are out there like checked out. Can you maybe talk just a little bit? And I know that's not your, your expertise to talk about like all the data on that, but can you talk about it from at least your perspective? It seems like if men don't have something to protect, they either become angry, often misogynist, like resentful of women, or they just check out. And so that's the first part of my question. And then after you talk about that, I want to, I want to not forget to ask you just about the issue of marriage. So, I mean, can you talk like, what do you think there's this connection to this great resignation? Like that Anthony Bradley talks about and that your husband, Nicholas Aberstadt has written about in men without work, like for who, for what, what am I here for? I'm out of here. I got nothing to do. Which is another way of 
phrasing the identity problem out there, right? The identity crisis. What am I for? Mm, yeah. And if I am for nothing, then why don't I stay in the basement? I mean, we certainly know empirically that male achievement is closely related to marriage and children, and that men who are married make more money, men who are married with children uh, make more money. Not that it's all about dollars and cents, but obviously uh, having to go home and answer to people to whom one is closely related puts a certain amount of pressure uh, on men to help out, especially since no matter how politically incorrect it is, it remains the case that women way disproportionately shoulder child rearing, whether they are working moms in the paid marketplace or not, they are, uh, as just about any couple with children will tell you, they are working harder at that. Oh, I'll tell you that. Sure. <laughs> Once I was at a con- I was at a conference in New York and we were like, I think we have seven children now. We had four children and I was at like this cocktail party or something. I said, How many children do you have? Four. And they said, oh, you're busy. And I was look, kind of looked around this very nice place and said, well, my wife is busy. I mean, I felt so guilty. <laughs> I told her that when she came up, she goes, well, at least thank you for living in reality. All right. Anyway, but yes, but it is true. I mean, and so, okay, but back to this question. So men, it's not just, it's not just um, money, but it's productivity and kind of positive use of their energy and their skills to serve other people. Right. I mean, that's like money is the marker in a sense of the fact that these men are actually doing something with their lives and therefore they're making more money, but they're also maybe happier. What's the data show on that? Well, the data show that happiness is closely tied to work and to family. And so if you have neither of those, you can draw your own conclusions about some of the suffering out there. But I do want to stress, Michael, that these uh, trends that we're talking about are exist across the Western world. So in other words, in Japan, which seemed to pioneer uh, the, you know, the isolated family, the one child family, they're not as big on divorce as we are and as the Europeans are, but they sort of pioneered the atomized family. And in Japan, there is a phenomenon of young men who have what we would call agoraphobia and never leave their room. This same thing can be seen in South Korea. And in both places, you have very low fertility rates and low marriage rates. So the conclusion I draw from that, again, is that if men don't live in a way that they're put in charge of something to protect, there is this collapse that we are seeing not only in the employment numbers, but a sort of societal collapse of young men in the prime of their lives, not learning and not taking ownership. There is no sign that that reverses itself anytime soon. Yeah, that's a, I want to get to that reversal question because I think it's pretty discouraging and worrisome because it doesn't look like what's going to get us out of this uh, unless something kind of uh, tragic or, or big shock. Let, let me ask a question that is maybe a silly one, but um, I think about kind of the incel problem. I do think it's connected to pornography. Uh, this kind of people are watching pornography and they just like, that's their image of what a woman is. She's a thing to provide gratification, but that's not what women are. Right. Right. And, and not only is it not what women are, cause it reduces women, but like it misses the fact that like women are intelligent, funny, smart, human subjects like you, they're just women. Right. So like, I don't know. And this is maybe why my question is maybe it's naive or silly, but in a sense, it's like, what do you, want in life what you want if you're a man you want to get married to a faithful spouse you want good friends and you want some purpose in your life i actually like i don't i'm not a big marvel fan but i actually liked the last spider-man i think i've talked about this in the podcast because peter parker has a friend that he loves and who loves him ned and it's not sexual it's not a homosexual it's just friendship and he has this kind of beloved romantic interest that's also not sexual. It's pure, like, oh, they like each other. It's romantic. And that's what he wants out of life. And then he has to give up all of that 
by sacrificing himself for their good and the good of others. Not his transhumanism of spider powers, but actually his humanity where he has to like sacrifice himself to be alone. And so like even the movies, like every, this is what you want out of life. And so part of me thinks to the incels, and I say this with like, not, not hostility, but like, like friend, like, why don't you go find a nice girl that doesn't, like stop thinking of the porn star or the pop star or the movie star, find a nice, lovely girl who you can be good friends with, get married, have children and like build a life together. And I mean, like, what? like it's almost like I'm saying it in, in this way. I don't mean it in a harsh way, but it's almost like, can't you see that's what you want? And it's almost like, I can't see it. Like it's, it's blind to them. Am I missing something? How would you respond to that? Well, trying to empathize with the incels, I do think that it is harder than it used to be for mm -hmm. a young yeah. man like that to follow your advice, Michael. Well, I think so, too. I think it's so, too. harder for a couple of reasons. First of all, the sexes are different. Just putting that thought out there. And so there's a certain amount of negotiation involved and a certain amount of mystery involved uh, in any encounter between the sexes. Right. So what if you have not had, say, a sister to study, <laughs> to learn about what this other creature is like? Or what if uh, you've grown up in a home, as many boys do, where there's only mom, and again, implicitly, you're getting that message, men are bad, men are unreliable, or you might also be getting the message, w women are nags, women don't like men. Subliminally, mm -hmm. I think a lot of this is operating on boys of this generation, on the Zoomers and the millennials, and it's part of what is making it hard to do the obvious, which is, look, fall in love, have kids, <laughs> get married in the opposite order, uh, and <laughs> and be as happy as we are allowed to be in this world. They don't know how to put one foot in front of the other sometimes. I think that's the problem. And, and there is an unseen fear there, too, that does not get the credit that it should. Is there any way out? Do you see a way out? How, how, what is there a possibility for, uh, we're talking about, like especially on the side, boys, to see this way out and, and also... Like, what do you think the problem is on the girl side? Are they just not interested in these? Like, how, how, what do you think? I think the ambient feminism of our time is also poisoning romance. It's not as catastrophic as, say, pornography. But the feminism of our time sends the message to girls that men are not to be trusted, that all men are rapists or potential rapists, and you know this sort of nonsense that can't help but trickle down into the consciousness of vulnerable adolescents of both sexes. So there's a lot that needs undoing out there. What I try to do is name the problem correctly, because if we don't do that, if we get the diagnosis wrong, there's no fixing any of that. Now, right now in this country, there are people who think the biggest problem is structural racism. And it, racism exists. Racism is a sin in the eyes of the Catholic Church and other religious bodies. But structural racism does not explain the kind of social breakdown that we are seeing because we're seeing it across races. This is what I mean. If we don't understand the nature of what ails us, we are not going to be able to fix anything. So my hope is that by shedding light, there is that occasional moment of recognition of, aha, so that's what it is. It, it, it isn't that I'm bad because I was born male. <laughs> it isn't that I have to change my gender because some people hate my sex so much. No, it's something else. There's some other problem here. Right. And I, I do think... Michael, that transgenderism is deeply connected to all of this <clears throat> because there's a discussion out there. Is it that there's more transgenderism now or is it that it was always there, but we just stigmatized it and punished it so much that people didn't feel free to come forward? I think there's a third way of looking at this, which is very connected to that book, which is in a time of this kind of identity confusion, in a time when 
people don't know who they are on all kinds of levels, it would be surprising if we didn't see a rise in transgenderism and other uh, non-traditional forms of sexuality. You talk about this in, in the book. You have a whole chapter on androgyny. I think part of this, because I'm trained in philosophy, I think there's also philosophical errors at the back. Like we tend to think of ourselves as kind of driving around in a body like we drive around in a car. And so we, in a sense, you know, people say, well, I'm not really comfortable in my body. Like, and the answer is, yeah, no one's comfortable. And I'm like, we're like, we're always a little awkward about things, but, but who is this you that has a body? And what, and I think a part of it is a, a confusion about what it means to be an embodied person. I also think there's theological elements behind it in Christian theology right? In, in the, say, I'm Catholic, so in the, in the, in the Nicene Creed, right at the end, what you, we believe in the resurrection of the body. So the body's not an accident in, say, Jewish and Christian understandings of our embodiment. It's not something we're trying to escape from. But I think there's also that kind of ethos of Manichaeanism, like philosophically, going on. But I do think you're right, though, that we don't want to over-philosophize it. And that, in a sense, I mean, that's a, it's a pretty powerful statement. Like you said, Maybe the surprise would be if we didn't see this rise in androgyny and transgenderism in a place where people don't know who they are. They're deeply confused. You talk about androgyny and, and transgenderism. Can you talk about what, what you say in the book? Yes, that the way we now live rewards boys for acting more like girls and rewards girls for acting more like boys. So on both sides, there is this gravitation to an androgynous mean. On the part of boys, again, growing up in an increasingly feminized culture, public education is almost entirely female. Many, many female-headed homes are out there. Boys are getting the message all the time that they are problematic and on the plus side, the popularity of somebody like Jordan Peterson, or I should say Jordan Peterson, is very important because that's exactly the void he's speaking into. Well, just but to quickly, still, I, before you mm -hmm. do the Josh, I actually had a note because I wanted to go to the insult question in the boys. And I wanted to actually, I actually had a note to bring up Jordan Peterson, who in our house, we, he, uh, my son has labeled him JP3. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, so sometimes I'll have fun. I was like, oh, you know, JP2, you, you mean JP2? No, no, JP3, Jordan Peterson. And, uh, but I think he really, in a sense, touched upon that question for boys. Like you can, you have something to say in this world. Like you have something to do in this world. You should be a protector. And I, I think that was very, I think, you know, a lot of people criticized him. I had, somebody had pointed, you know, pointed me to Jordan Peterson a while ago. And so I was listening to all his talks on Genesis and, as I said, I'm a Catholic. I'm like, oh, okay, some of it's okay. And he's, you know, he likes, jo you know, Joe Camafiore and I'm skeptical of that. But I mean, I just thought this was good stuff. And then I actually quoted him a talk I gave, but nobody knew who he was. And, and then that blow up thing where he was interviewed and he said like, gotcha, you know, to the lady. And um, all these people were like, Jordan Peterson is just like angry man. And I thought, I'm married with children. I like Jordan Peterson. I find him helpful. My, I'm my <laughs> brother-in-law who's in his twenties. He's now 30. He's married. He has three children. He's happily. He's, he likes Jordan Peterson. All these people who like Jordan Peterson weren't just kind of angry men, but like men, they just liked him and women liked him, you know? And so I thought like, I thought anyway, just to kind of uh, talk about JP three here for a minute, I do think he does touch to that problem. And, and I think that's, you're right though, in a feminized culture, he's very, he had something to offer that I think was intellectually serious and practical and was in fact really a promoter of protectors, not predators. I don't know what you think about that, but anyway, I interrupted you on JP3, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is indicative of the fact, his popularity is indicative of the fact that not only is he gifted, but he is speaking to millions of young men who need to hear what he has to say which is essentially a common sense notion right. that masculinity is not bad. Right. Now, on the part of the, the young women, I think they also get the converse message that it's better for them to be more like men. They get this from feminism. They get this from school. But they also get it, I think, at the deepest level because there are new threats to women out there. Women are, first of all, 
unprotected in the primal sense that fewer of them have fathers, brothers, cousins, and other male figures in their lives who could be expected to step up in case something does go badly for them. We saw this again in hashtag me too. It is astonishing how few women in those high profile cases reported having a father involved or a brother involved or an uncle or any other male figure. Once in a great while, a boyfriend was mentioned. Otherwise, these girls were on their own. This is also connected to the transgender phenomenon in a particularly poignant way, because as we know from the work of Abigail Schreier and others, most of the, quote, transitioning that's being seen now is girls wanting to be boys or more boy-like or whatever it is. And plainly, they are responding to a world in which they are objectified as never before, thanks to internet pornography. Uh, as one young woman said to me once, we never know when we're talking to a boy what his eyes looked at last. Well, I think, by the way, I think that's a, re- that's a real problem. I mean, you have, like, this, I can imagine girls, I mean, I have daughters, like, you think, like, they have these friends who are nice boys, but like, are they looking at pornography? Like, what? that's destructive to the intellect, destructive to the soul, to destructive of education, of love. I mean, it's really problematic. And it, in a sense, makes you unmarriageable. As a man, a man, like you're like not marriageable. Like why, like you, because you, it's like, there's some like deep disorder, like you need healing from that. Not, you know, I think that's more profound than we want to admit. I agree with that. And on a positive note, Michael, I think there's a lot more, attentiveness about this from the non-religious world than there was, uh, say, 10 years ago. 10 years Mm -hmm. ago, you couldn't say anything about pornography without being ostracized. Um, And today it is different. There are secular, there's secular pushback. There are celebrities who say this is a bad thing. There are places where people can get help that are not religious in origin. So I think this one is turning around a little bit. Uh, Let's just hope that more of that trickles down. But as to the idea that women, young women especially, face unique threats, I am absolutely down with that. I mean, starting in the womb, where they are more likely to be offed if they are girls than if they're boys. Absolutely. And then continuing on through wondering, you know, what people are seeing when they see them as young women, that saying, I'm not comfortable in my body, is something that any woman who has been looked at as an object would say, I'm not mm-hmm. comfortable in my body. I'd, I'd like to hide it. I'd like it to look different. So I have a lot of empathy for the people who, you know, the young people who try to take this to its logical conclusion, even as I think that the adults in their life should stop them and understand that transgenderism isn't the answer to any of this. Right. So, yeah. So, and what do you, I, I agree with that completely, completely. Um, what, so like you, you, you have this sense of girls wanting, so you think that the girls desire to be boys is in a sense is to like de-objectify themselves. Yes. Okay. And then for the boys. Most boys today are growing up in a world where mainly they have to please women, where the authority figures in their lives are women, whether it's mom or teachers. There are exceptions, of course, coaches. But if you look at what's happened with uh, civic association in this country, there used to be other answers to this, especially for boys, things like the Boy Scouts or church youth groups who could serve as you know, a socializing function for young men. A lot of these, as the work of Robert Putnam has documented, don't exist anymore. So the options for boys are fewer. And I think that's also part of the picture. That's also part of what's doing damage out there. Yeah, so it's almost like in order to be included, I have to be like a girl or a girl, like in a sense, like, I mean, I think especially in school, you know, you, me- you mentioned this, like, what is it? 60% of college students are now women. Girls are really good at school. Boys tend to 
tend to be like, you know, a little bit wilder. They often get diagnosed with ADD. They're given medication, which they probably don't need in a lot of cases. I mean, there are some cases of course, but I mean, I think it's over, over prescribed. And in a sense, like, you know, it makes sense that say a 25 year old, 30 year old female teacher who doesn't have sons doesn't understand what boys are like. So I think that's probably, do you think that's pressure as well? Yes, absolutely. You know, it reminds me, Michael, of that song in My Fair Lady, where Henry Higgins sings, Why Can't a Woman Be More Like a Man? Right, I right. think from the point of view of many female authority figures in schools and elsewhere who don't have much experience of boys and men anymore, what they want is for the boys to be more like the girls because the girls are easier. Yeah, that's right. I, I said I have, I have boys and girls and... Um you know, my little baby's a boy and he's funny. I mean, he's, he's a boy. Like he's, you just like, he knows what he wants. He's focused. Give me the stuff, you know? And, um, he's not, I remember when I, so I had a boy and then two girls and a boy and then two girls and a boy. So, so I remember my fourth child's a boy. And so I had this boy first and then I had two girls and then I have this little boy and he, all of a sudden, like, he's just like crazy. And I, for a minute I was, I mean, Mary, I was like, Whoa, this boy's a problem. And I was like, wait a minute, I've seen this before. I had forgotten because I had these two, <laughs> I had these two girl babies. Now I have this boy. And like I had forgotten. And my wife and I kind of laughed about like, oh, right, we forgot. Right. And so with the third boy, we're like, we remember. We know what you're like. You're not pulling a fast one on us. Anyway, and but that's sweetness. There's something sweet. There's something exciting about that. And I think you're you're right. I mean, that's a good, like the Henry Higgins line is is I think interesting. You're easier to handle. Hey, that's true. I, I think it's a problem where, in a sense, what's natural kind of boyish behavior that needs to be moderated and ordered towards energy and protection is often instead looked down upon as something bad. Like, don't do that. But it, what we really want to do is order that to a protector. And if we suppress it, then in a sense, I wonder if that's part of the incel and also what I call the enabler, not the intentional, but the enabler of the predatorial life. That, like, it's you're. You know, Joseph Pieper is one of my favorite philosophers. He talks about like anger, you know, is a deadly sin, but it's also this gift we have to stand up to injustice. So there's all these energies in boys. You can talk in, in natural language that are biologically, we're more physically strong in the upper body, you know, et cetera, that are given to us as gifts, however we want to articulate it, theologically, biologically, that are supposed to be used to use JP3, you know, to bring order out of chaos. And in, I think you're right that those are kind of suppressed. Do you think that I'm articulating that well enough? That they're suppressed in boys so that in a sense, they're almost like feeling bad about who they are. I agree with everything you said, except for the almost. I think a lot of boys do feel bad about who they are and they don't know what they're supposed to do to fix it. And that's a very good question um, yeah. and gives us empathy for the young men as well as for the young women. No, I think that's right. And I think this point of empathy is just so important. And I think that goes back to the diagnosis. When you understand the diagnosis, when you get it better, all of a sudden it gives you empathy. And then hopefully it can start to point to some some ways out. So I've taken a lot of your time. I want to just finish on a couple of areas. One of the first, or the, I guess the second chapter of your book, it, you what you do, we've talked about, the, we've kind of talked about what you call the great scattering maybe go back to that just for a minute, but one of the things you, you start out with, which I think is also another valuable of the book is you say like, what's going on with identity politics, what's going on with loneliness. And you, you start with Alan Bloom's the closing of the American mind where you have this, you like people have, he said the aptest description I can find for the state of student souls. And now for everybody's souls really is the psychology of separateness. And you say, what Bloom discerned was not identity politics per se, but the antecedent without which they would not have been possible. The unique isolation of late baby boomers and generation Xers who were populating his college classrooms. And although this aspect does not seem to have noticed much, he Bloom repeatedly connected the solitariness of his individuals to a phenomenon explained more and more by divorce. Well, then, and then you kind of go through like questions of multiculturalism or Todd Gitlin's book, like The Twilight of Common Dreams or The Disuniting of America, right? And uh, Mark Lilla's books and everything. So could you do maybe quickly without just kind of go through 
what are the, some of the competing views of our problem with identity politics and brokenness? And then maybe talk about, like maybe, I guess you've already kind of said it, but reiterate a little bit why you think that those don't do justice to the problem. So in that chapter, I was trying to give an intellectual history of what might be called the what's going on out there problem. Because for decades now, there has been this sense among thinkers on the left and the right that there's something weird out there, that something is going on with the young. And we see this in Bloom very clearly. Bloom keeps tracing it to divorce. I think he was right. But we also see other answers. It's well, it's the rise of multiculturalism or it's uh, factionalism, tribalism. We hear that a lot now too. And I do think that all of these answers have a, a piece of what's going on. But the fundamental rupture is the one that Bloom was calling divorce, but that we could call by other names too, like those acts of subtraction that I opened with. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not just divorce, it's abortion that takes siblings out of other siblings' lives and takes sons and daughters out of parents' lives and grandsons and granddaughters out of grandparents' lives. Uh, it's uh, single motherhood, which however heroic comes with the kind of psychological pressures that we were talking about, uh, such that boys should be more like girls or less like boys. And of course, fatherlessness. So in all of these cases, I think what's happened is a, a compounding of problems that are now so compounded that they amount to a free-floating chaos out there. Again, even before COVID, there were reports by psychiatrists and other experts that mental health problems were skyrocketing among young people. Anxiety, depression, you could write the list as well as I can. And there was also agreement by the experts that these were real rises. This wasn't just that we were getting better at seeing these things, it's that they were actually on the increase. What is that about? Uh, I think the short answer is people aren't grounded. People don't feel like lots of people have their backs. People don't feel like they're being equipped to go out into the world because they're not being taught even how to be a girl or how to be a boy. And this connects not only to divorce, but back to the sexual revolution and its many uh, different kinds of fracturing in the world. No, it's, it's very good. And I think like, for example, just to one point, you kind of go over different arguments. And as you say, you know, there, there, there are multiple, there are many things, but at the core of it is the family. And I thought, I thought your critique of the tribal argument was actually really, really good. Where, you know, you're talking about, there's one idea that there's, we've kind of gone into these tribes, right? And, um, you know, Trump tribes and right, Democrat tribes, progressive tribes. And, you know, you say, country music tribes, bros, nerds, wasps, deadheads, Packers fans, Facebook groups, things the Uber tribe, the nation state. And um, you're quoting, I think, uh, Andrew Sullivan at that point. And you said, this is a key passage, not only as an example of tribe think, but also in the wider, a widening argument of this book, because it omits what was, what is, or was the alpha tribe of all. And um, you say, it's not the case that America wasn't built for humans, as the title of Andrew Sullivan's New York piece put the point. It's rather that America, like other civilizations, was built for humans, who learned community, not from roving bands of unrelated nomads, but from those around them, beginning, first of all, with the community of the family. And I, I think that you said, you know, finally, the instrumental problem with the tribes is its faulty anthropology. Tribes themselves grow out of family and extended family. And humanity does not gravitate towards anonymous or forced packs any more than other animals do, right? He, and I, I love this line. You say, you say, to believe otherwise is to accept a just-so story that does not hold up under inspection, just like the fable of the lone wolf. Do you want to just develop like maybe the idea of tribe and why you think like, cause I think a lot of people buy into the tribal stuff, right? I mean, I think they're, and I would say, yeah, there are factions and, and things, but as the fundamental element, I think you, you're right that it's a sexual revolution, but do you want to just quickly comment on the tribe question? Well, one of the problems with the way that we talk about tribalism is that it gives tribalism a bad name. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, I, I can't help but think of a friend 
from Uganda. Uh, I was talking to a couple of years ago and we were reflecting on the differences between what's regarded as a problem here and what's regarded as a problem there. And he said, but you know, here's one problem I don't have. Um, in my tribe, what I count as my immediate or family is uh, about 220 people strong. He said, we're never lonely. And that's anecdotal evidence only, but I think it really shines a light on what I'm trying to do in this book, because that is a common sense observation by someone coming from a very different sort of society in which a tribe is a good thing. Whereas when we use that word tribalism, it's meant to be a bad thing, but we use it because we are ignoring what's actually going on in our society, which is the breakdown of the smallest and most important tribe of all. Right. Yeah, that's, that's right. So I mean, just a couple of quick questions. One thing you've mentioned a couple of times in the sexual revolution is the pill. And you also mentioned um, the biological anthropologist, uh, Lionel Tiger. And for the record, like Michael Miller, like to be named Lionel Tiger would be so much better. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I mean, I, it's hard to read his book and be like, well, that's, you have a cooler name than I. Okay. But Lionel Tiger wrote this book called the decline of males. And you just referred to it a little bit, but at one point he, I, in his book, he does a study which you, you probably know, where they gave contraceptives to chimpanzees. And it it really created havoc on the way the males really, the way the females reacted. And in a sense, there's like, that's another area that you're not allowed to talk about. You're not allowed to talk about contraceptives. You're not allowed to talk to the pill. But the pill really, I mean, is, you know, there's a friend is a, a physician and she talks about you know, if you think for women, this is like one of the life cycle things. You know, you've talked about your cardiac, your 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 your, your respiratory system. Your your you you have all these kind of systems that are keeping you alive. Well, you know, for women, the menstrual cycle is part of life, and it's a sign of vitality and health. And we've just manipulated that through technological means, which has, as we're seeing, you know, health effects. Uh, it's a potential car carcinogen and other things, but it really is like disordering male female relationships. I mean, you mentioned it a couple of times. I think people may be shocked to hear us talking about that. What would you say to, how would you kind of explain why the pill and this is part of the sexual revolution? Why it's such an important element? I think it's one of the most important things that's happened in the world. I mean, in human history, since Eve took the apple from Adam, it changed everything. And it changed everything in ways that were not obvious at the time. So for example, contraception was sold on the idea that it would make marriages stronger if parents were more empowered in this way, that it would level the playing field in the economic uh, workplace, uh, that it would reduce abortion. Margaret Sanger argued that, mm -hmm. Margaret Sanger and others, other like-minded people. Well, now we know that the opposite happened with the embrace of contraception and the destigmatization of uh, non-marital sex. Instead, abortions skyrocketed, as did broken homes, fatherlessness, and all the rest of it. And it would take a lot longer than a podcast to explain how these things are related. But fundamentally... You're welcome to come back. <laughs> I think fundamentally... <laughs> thank you. Uh Lionel Tiger was really onto something. And the reason he's so interesting is that he is an independent mind. He has described religion as a toxic force. He's not a religious person. He doesn't have any use for that stuff. But his insight in that book, The Decline of Males, mm -hmm. was that if all control over reproduction is given to women, what's the point of being a man? If this is no longer a joint enterprise, the... Mm -hmm man, woman, child triad. If women, thanks to feminism and uh, contraception and abortion, call all the shots over whether there is a next generation or not, then why wouldn't men walk away? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that insight has percolated into our very moment and some of the other things that we've talked about, like the incels, the men's rights movement, and this kind of thing where you see 
disenfranchised men who are angry about their disenfranchisement. And for those men, I think there was no better secular prophet than Lionel Tiger. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's, that's well said. Um, I think, you know, I think you actually mentioned it in your book that it, it ends up with the Swedish theory of love, right? Where you're just kind of isolated individuals and which is a documentary, but uh, the, yeah. And I think you, you see this too. Like you saw this, you know, this story of like all these, I think it was, I mean, Germans or Dutch, I'm not sure the European, I forget where it was, but uh, they were on the train and like some woman was being hurt and they were all kind of just watching. Right. And he's like, why aren't you doing anything about it? And they were kind of skinny too. I mean, like there was this, there's, I think there's actually, this is beyond the podcast, but there's, you know, um, I can't remember her name now. She wrote a book called downfall or down. It's about basically the drop of sperm drops in testosterone. I mean, so there's, there's actually, I think biological things going on, uh, that you see, uh, with men and with women with fertility. This is again, kind of outside the, the scope of your book, but I do think it, it goes back to that animal point that you made. I mean, like we're, we are rational animals, we're political animals, but we are animals. And we're, I think there's a, a technocratic way, whether it's the pill or other, um, elements in our, in our environment and our food that are actually biologically harming us. And this is having a, a, an impact. I don't know if you've done any work on that and the data on that, if you want to comment or not, but. I've been reluctant to go there, but once National Geographic put the intersex fish on its cover, it seemed very hard to argue anymore with the idea that too much estrogen is having really weird effects out there. Um, Mm -hmm. And I would just leave it at that. But the bottom line is that if we performed on other animals, the kinds of experiments that we are running on ourselves, whether they're with estrogen or family disruption, or uh, say, aborting baby elephants, if we interfered in the natural order of other species, the way we are interfering with ourselves, there would be massive outcry. And that's the real take home from the book is that we are applying a double standard here. And our ability to see the suffering of animals if their lives are disrupted by science or anything else, ought to translate into our ability to see what we're doing to ourselves, including the avoidable kinds of suffering that we are creating with the experiments since the sexual revolution. Yeah, no, I think that's well said. So just a couple quick, you know, Mark Lilla, this is also neat put about the book, by the way, for listeners. So um, Mary Reset wrote this book, Primal Screams, uh, which you should buy. And at the end of the book, there's three essays, one by Rod Dreher, one by Mark Lilla, and one by Peter Thiel. And Dreher's is a bit more kind of like affirmative. And Mark Lilla's and Peter Thiel's are both affirmative, but like kind of argue, well, you're, you know, you're leaving out capitalism, especially this is Mark Lilla's and like, and the effects of the market economy and consumerism. And, and, he, and, and she, he says, you know, not the sexual revolution. Right. But it's really this ability to have more middle class taste determined choice. And that plus a Bauman's concept of liquid modernity in contemporary life, that supercharged capitalism and consumerism, you know, are really more important than the sexual revolution in this kind of individualism. How do you respond to that? Yeah, I have two comments about Mark Lilla's response. First of all, I'd like to say I'm grateful that he participated because the Mm -hmm. ideological divide is so awful now that a lot of people won't talk to other people. But Mark took this assignment seriously, read the book, and I think his contribution is very interesting. Mm -hmm. So the part that I agree with is that consumerism is always a danger. We as Catholics are taught that consumerism is a spiritual danger. There are reasons why we're taught that. We need to inculcate in our kids and ourselves that you can't go shopping for people the way you can go shopping for a new headset. And we always have to be aware that there's a a danger of this habit of consumerism spilling over into spheres where it doesn't belong. So I I think that he was right about that. and And as a related point, I think he was right to criticize the unthinking embrace of more economic freedom uh, as the solution to all of our problems. 
I agree, that's by the right. way, with both of those. Mm-hmm. I think that's right. I mean, and I, I mean, I work for the Acton Institute where we think that free competitive market economies and commutative justice is really important. But every year I give a lecture on the cultural critiques of capitalism and there are dangers of capitalism, dangers mm-hmm. of kind of applying commutative justice to places where it should not be applied. Right. So, I mean, like family is a place for distributive justice, not for commutative justice. And then, and, and also just, um, I think the reality that market economies do come with, with real dangers. And I actually argue, you'll be happy to hear that. Um, I actually argue that one of the ways to mitigate some of the dangers of globalization and markets and consumerism is actually families and communities. Like that's actually, and that we're almost, we're in a perfect storm right now because we have kind of hyper consumerism, political centralization, the breakdown of community, and most important, the breakdown of family. And so what could be like a tiger, like, you know, like the Celtic tiger or the Asian tigers, what could be a tiger for positive growth actually ends up being a tiger that also wreaks destruct, you know, in, in our communities. And I think, so I think especially when families break down, market economies are even, and consumerism is even more dangerous than it is just on its own. I don't know if you want to say that, but I I think, so I think bringing up the market thing is important, but I think to blame it all on the market is actually missing what I think you you say properly, that it's ultimately comes down to the the great scattering. Yes. Well, and that's the part that I disagree with Mark Lilla about, because he goes on to make the point that, as he says, conservatives are addicted to narratives of decline, as if that disposes of my argument, which it doesn't really. That's just a fill up. That's just a, you know, funny turn of phrase or a clever turn of phrase. But what if there is real decline? What if we really are in a bad place? And I think we are. And I think you agree with me, Michael. You don't get rid of it by waving a wand and saying, well, it's just those conservatives looking at the glass being half empty again. Right. Yeah. I mean, because there's depression, anxiety, obesity. I mean, these are real problems. Again, I think that, yeah, the, <clears throat> the narrative, I agree with you. So the last one is Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel actually also likes your book. He thinks it's the, the generally right. He says, he's, you're correct. That religious belief is not a matter of context-free choice, but he kind of focuses on, in a sense, the weakening of the middle class you know, he has that famous line, like they promised us flying cars and all we got was 140 characters. And he says that, you know, we basically have a weakening of the middle class. And he says, perhaps as most important as the pill was Jane Jacobs' signature victory over Robert Moses in 1962. She preserved Greenwich Village against a proposed highway, but set New York decades, uh, New York on a decades long arc of over more expensive housing, right? Now that's a whole other question because we also, I think, put highways through nice ethnic neighborhoods in places like Detroit, which created urban flight. So that's a whole debate. But I think his point there is we've made decisions that have harmed the middle class over time and that that's a bigger or at least equally um, important reason for this decline. What, What do you say to Peter Thiel? I have a lot of sympathy for his argument. I come from the Rust Belt which once was a vibrant uh, middle class and lower middle class kind of place uh, and doesn't look that way anymore. But then again, the problems that we have been talking about, problems of men being seemingly unable to marry, of people marrying later and later, people not forming families or forming them late if they form them at all, people seeming in general to be afraid of these institutions of marriage, family, community, these are not problems that we can solve at the margins with tax incentives. These We, we don't revive the middle class just by looking at how to materially incentivize it. That would be my criticism there. We have to look at what made the middle class rise in the first place, and part of it was marrying young and having families and wanting to improve their lot because they had things to be responsible for and to protect. So I think that Peter Thiel and I are looking at different sides of this chicken and egg tussle. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is making a valid point, but going forward, uh, I don't see how we rebuild a middle class without rebuilding the family on which the middle class was based. Yeah. 
No, I think that's right. And I think, I mean, you say like to the conclusion of your book, you say, you know, as you talk about the effects of the sexual revolution, you said, did anyone really think things would turn out otherwise? Right. That massive global kinship dislocations of the past 60 years would not produce visible transformative effects, not only on in individual lives and households, but on politics and culture. And you quote the novelist, um, do you say it, Co- Coetzee, J.M. Coetzee? Um, the mm-hmm. South African, I think, isn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he, he says the following, you quote him. And it's, it's great. Destroying the family life of highly social intelligent animals leads inevitably to misery among individual survivors and pathological misbehavior among the group. And you say, he was, of course, speaking of elephants, right? That we have seen elephant breakdown when elephants are separated from their families. You talk about the treed cat. And yet we've done a much bigger, much bigger uh, experiment, as it were, on millions of people throughout the world with the sexual revolution. And you end and say, you know, conservatives and other non-progressives have missed something major about identity politics. It's authentic. It's authentic. It's the identity policies is, has authenticity, but liberal progressive side has missed something even bigger or bigger. I, you didn't say even so going bigger identity politics is not so much politics as a primal scream. It's the result of the great scattering of our species, an unprecedented collective retreat from our very selves. And, and I, as you say, anyone who's ever heard a coyote in the desert separate at night from the pack knows the sound. And that's really the hysteria of our time and that, that it is, we've done this major experiment and the kind of volatility is actually a scream for a scream of loneliness and separateness. And in a sense, a scream for help. And that that's why empathy and attempt like diagnosis is so correct. And I, that that's my kind of summary of like what, why your book matters is because you're trying to correctly diagnose a problem. It gives us empathy and then at least begins the point the way, okay, now we can think about solving it. Cause if we're not paying attention to this, we're just working around the edges. Do I get it? You get it. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, any other like final thoughts you want to give, like any kind of like key thing that, or any recommendations of readings or that people could, to, who are interested in this could want to learn about? And I'll put links to like your white site and your other books, Adam and Eve before the pill and how the West really lost God, which I think is, it's also a really, uh, how the West really lost God is a really interesting book on kind of population decline that um, I think is important as well. So I'll put links to all that up, but a- any other kind of final comments or suggested readings or anything? Oh, thank you, Michael. That book, how the West really lost God is the flip side of this debate in many ways, because in it, I show how the decline of the family and the decline of organized religion in the West cannot be understood apart from each other. It's very important to see that when we talk about the rise of the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, and secularization and the decline of religion, it's very important to know what's not going on there. What's not going on there is that people have gotten smarter and they don't need God anymore. What's not going on there is that the truth claims of Christianity have all been uh, exposed as rotten. No, what is going on there is that with the collapse of the family, the transmission belt of organized religion collapsed. And so if anyone listening to this has gotten to the end of this program, that might be an argument uh, that you'd be, uh, you, you might want to look in on. No, it's great. I think it's really important. And it, it, you know, I sometimes will say like, what's the primary place where religion is, and culture are passed down? It's not the homily. It's not the sermon. It's the family. And so, you know, Dawson, Christopher Dawson said, you know, cultus is the driving force of culture and culture is passed down through the family. And so I think this whole connection is really, really important. I, I, yeah, that's, I read that book a couple of years ago and it's a really important book. I highly recommend it. Um, okay, well, Mary, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. You took a lot of time to talk to me about your great book, Primal Screams. So to listeners, I will put up links for all this stuff. You can get the book, Primal Screams, How the Sexual Revolution Created Identity Politics, and um, also links to like your work uh, and, and all of your other writings. But I really appreciate your taking the time to join me on the Moral Imagination Podcast. Oh, thank you, Michael. I enjoyed it very much. And I also wanted to mention that there is a website, maryeberstadt.com, that is kept up and current and uh, has information about the books, but also about whatever I've been writing lately. 
Wonderful. I'll put links up to that and promote that as well. Everybody go look at it. Read Mary Averstadt. Your life will be better for it. Okay. Thank you very much. And, and I appreciate you taking the time to be with me. Thank you, Michael. It was great. 